right. Hey, can we welcome, we've got uh, much of our church family that are watching us online due to all the circumstances, but can we put our hands together and just welcome all of our friends joining us today. God bless you guys on all the social media platforms and online. Just so good to have you guys with us. And I just want to quickly say happy Mother's Day as well to all of the mothers here today. Appreciate you joining us. And I want to take a moment to say happy Mother's Day to my mom, Sonia. She lives over in St. Petersburg. She watches us pretty much every Sunday. She calls me every Sunday night to kind of tell me how I need to do better in my messages. No, she, she's always very sweet, and very complimentary. But mom, I love you. And uh, man, I hope all the moms just really feel special today. Well, today we're going to continue in a series of messages that we started last week. We're calling this all in. It's kind of the theme of what we're focusing on. And this this whole idea of all in comes from the game of poker. There's this kind of high stakes moment in the game of poker where the person takes all of their chips, all of their resources, and they shove it towards the middle of the table and they put everything on the line for that particular hand. And that move in poker is such a high risk, high stakes move that 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 all in type of concept has become a metaphor in American culture. And when people talk about going all in, what they're talking about is a 100 percent wholehearted commitment to something. It's putting everything on the line. And in this series, we're talking about going all in for God's purposes and God's mission for our lives and for our local church. And so we've been digging into that whole idea. And here at Life Church, we state this mission that God has given us. He's given every believer, but this is how we say it here at Life Church. Our mission is helping people find and follow Jesus Christ. That's our mission. That's why we're here. This is what we do. And that's what mission is. It, it's kind of the what we're all about. This is what we're all called to do together. Now, today, we're going to focus on the how of our mission, all right? This is what we're, we're, we're assigned to do by Jesus, to help people find and follow Jesus, but there's, there's also a how. There's a way to go about it, and when we talk about how we go about it, what we're really is doing is describing our values, right? Our mission is the what. Our values are how we go about fulfilling that mission, and over these next couple of weeks, I'm going to roll out a few of those values. One of those values we're going to focus on today, which is this. We go about fulfilling this mission of helping people find and follow Jesus by this. We reject religion and we encounter Jesus. We reject religion and we encounter Jesus. Now, for for some of you, that might sound just a little bit strange, but but here's the idea. You You can't encounter Jesus unless you reject religion. If you don't reject religion... You really can't encounter Jesus. Now, for some of us, this sounds kind of confusing because we kind of have equated in our minds because of our upbringing or whatever that that the whole Jesus thing is, is a religious thing. When in fact, that is absolutely not the case. Religion is a man-made wall that is established that people need to climb in order to be accepted by God. That's, that's basically what religion is. And if I can earn God's acceptance by following and fulfilling a religious uh, system, then I really don't need a Savior because I can do it all myself. I just have to be good enough. I have to work hard enough, and I can achieve God's acceptance. If I can do that, I don't need a Savior. But the fact is, it's impossible for any of us to be 100% perfect all of the time. At some point, we're going to fail. At some point, we're going to fall. At some point, we're not going to be able to fulfill every single demand of of God's perfect holiness. And so every person at some point has to come to that crossroads to realize, hey, I can't save myself. I can't do this on my own. It's impossible for me to live an absolutely perfect, sinless life when it comes to my actions and all of my attitudes and all of my thoughts. See, it's completely impossible for us to do this. So we have to come to that crossroads to realize, listen, I can't be perfect enough, so I need to receive what Jesus has provided for me. So let's just define what we mean by religion, just to be very clear. Religion is any system of belief, behavior, or belonging that we put between us and God. 
See, this is a man-made system of, of whatever it is, of belief, behavior, or belonging that, that is put between us and God. Now, when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one of the things you're going to quickly realize is that Jesus absolutely rejects religion. He rejects religion completely. You can see this from his very first miracle all the way through his resurrection. Now, Jesus' first miracle, many of you know, was uh, the miracle that he performed at that wedding feast. Uh, he was there, and uh, these friends of their family were getting married. And this is that moment that Jesus turned the water into wine. Now, this was a very significant thing for many reasons. One was that culturally, wedding feasts were a multiple-day event. It wasn't like what we have today where we have a wedding and a, and a uh, uh, reception afterwards, and it's all done in a couple of hours. This was multiple days. And the family was responsible for providing for all the food and all the entertainment and everything for all of the guests. Well, at this particular wedding, uh, this had gone on for a couple of days, and they ran out of wine. Now, this is a huge, huge uh, uh, embarrassing moment for this family. It would be like serving, you know, the meal at the reception and, and not having enough for half of the guests at the reception that you invited. So this is a potentially very embarrassing moment. And so Jesus' mom, right? Moms, you know how moms are, right? So mom goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, all right, I know who you are. Help these people. Help these people out. We don't want them to be embarrassed. And so uh, Jesus says, don't you realize my, my hour hasn't yet come? It's not time for me to, to make my entrance, you know, as the miracle worker. Uh, but mom just wouldn't have it. And so she went to the, the servants of the banquet and said, listen, whatever he tells you to do, just do whatever he tells you to do. And I could just see Jesus rolling his eyes. Oh, mom. <laughs> okay. And so he performs this amazing miracle. And, it, and it's really interesting what, what, what Jesus uh, does as he performs this miracle and the way he performs this miracle. Look at John chapter 2. It says, Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing. That is very significant. Each holding uh, from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then when you read on, you see that Jesus worked this miracle of turning the little well water into wedding wine. But what's significant was that Jesus chose to perform this miracle in the ceremonial washing jars set aside for the ceremonial religious washing. See, in Jewish culture, what they would do is they would have, you know, this water where people, you know, was the whole idea was that people are unclean, people are sinful. And so what they would do is they would ceremonial wa ceremonially wash themselves to signify the, the purification that, that God wants to, to do in their lives. But it was all an outward act of religious duty. Now, Jesus could have performed this miracle by just filling the empty wine jars. Why didn't he do that? No, he said, bring out the ceremonial religious ones, and there I'm going to change the water into wine. What Jesus was basically doing was taking those items that were set apart for this, this religious ritual, and he was basically saying, hey, um, I am the fulfillment. He is sweeping aside, really, this old religious system by basically saying, hey, that, this is completely obsolete now. Because I am the fulfillment of what those purification, that purification process is supposed to, to represent. So his miracle was a miracle with a message. See, here's what we need to understand. Religion focuses on the external, not the internal. Just like the washing of the hands or, or whatever it is. Religion focuses on the system, the actions, the activities by suggesting that by the fulfillment of those actions and activities, by following the rules, that you gain acceptance uh, and forgiveness from God. And see, religious ceremonies focus on the outward ritual, but ignore the inward change and the inward transformation that God is really concerned about. Religion says, I have to work to get for, you know, God to accept me. And Jesus deals with this whole idea of religion. And at every point from his first miracle on, 
he begins to say, hey, we're sweeping that old system aside. It's not about rules and regulations. It's not about the outward thing. What I want to do is a work in the hearts of men and women. And Jesus wants to focus on the internal. And Jesus confronted this with the religious leaders of his day in Matthew 23. Jesus is confronting the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and he says, What sorrows await you, teachers of religious law, you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. See, Jesus is saying, you guys are all into the ceremony, you're all into doing everything just right to gain favor with God, but inside you're not changing. Inside, you're just full of sin and, and all this terrible stuff. Now, by the way, when you read Jesus' words to those religious leaders, it's no wonder that the Pharisees were not big fans of Jesus, right? Because he called them out. He, he spoke the truth to them. Now, we need to understand, as we're just discussing what we're all about as followers of Jesus Christ, toxicity, things outward things. They're not doing this. They're not doing that. They're not fulfilling all the, the religious code of the, the, the boxes that we'd like to check to say, hey, we're righteous and God, we're more acceptable to God than someone else. But how many of you know that God has a good way, uh, a healthy way of humbling us from time to time to letting us know that we're not all that in a bag of chips, right? Um, sometimes he just wants to remind us that we're kind of all in the same struggle. You know, before Gene and I came here to Auburndale, I was one of the pastors at a, about a 5,000-member church up in Huntsville, Alabama. Very wonderful church. A dear, dear friend of mine, Rusty Nelson, um, is the lead pastor there. I was a senior associate. And the church had multiple campuses around the region and a, a regional, multi-state outreach as far as their television ministry. And uh, I would speak, of course, you know, fairly often in the church. And, and it was just a wonderful, exciting environment. Well, the church had a, has, has still a wonderful reputation in that region. And uh, one particular winter, uh, my, my wife was feeling sick. She had a, had a flu. And we were talking about, you know, you know, the different things to try to, you know, get her better and over-counter medication. She was like, you know what? When I grew up, my, our family out in the country of West Tennessee, we used to make these hot toddies. Do you guys know what a hot toddy is? It's like a little homemade um, uh, deal that kind of knocks the, the flu out of you. And, um, you know, a couple of ingredients that you put into it that are really important. And one of those ingredients is Jack Daniels. All right? So think of it as NyQuil, but just the old school version of the NyQuil alcohol. And so I said, you know what, honey? I'm going to make you a hot, hot toddy, okay? So I need to go out. I'm going to go find some Jack Daniels. Pastor Dave, right? And so I decide, well, I don't want to embarrass the church that I'm serving and, and the reputation and maybe my reputation. So I went to the next county over. I actually went to Fayetteville, Tennessee to a little liquor, liquor store, a tattoo grocery store to, to buy some Jack Daniels. So I'm in there. I'm holding this big bottle of Jack Daniels and I'm looking at it. All of a sudden, I had this feeling that someone was next to me and I look over and it was a guy from the church saying, Pastor Dave? <laughs> and I'm just standing there like, hey, have you ever heard of a hot toddy? You, have, you know what a hot toddy? And I'm trying to explain, and I'm really embarrassed. And, you know, it's just there's so many ways that, you know, we just have to realize that the, the, our over-concern on image, our concern on people's opinions, our concerns on, you know, being able to check all those religious boxes of of, of you know, outward righteousness to impress people. See, none of those things earn us favor with God. Look at, look at Luke 18. Uh, Luke 18, verses 9 through 14 says, To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else. See, this is what religion does. Causes us to look down on people. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like uh, other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
I tell you, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So religion is is a toxic thing it, because it always leads to comparison. It always leads us to kind of look down. I'm more righteous than you. I'm more acceptable to God because I'm following all the rules. But see, the truth is, we need to get this. The only way any of us has favor with God is because of what Jesus did on the cross. favor with God. His life is actually transferred to our spiritual account before God. It's credited to us. And see, this is the reason we have acceptance from God. This is the reason we have forgiveness is when we put our faith in what Jesus Christ did for us. So it's so important to remember, and you need to know that if you're new to Life Church or if you're a regular here, we all just need to be reminded that at Life Church we reject religion. We reject this whole idea of achieving righteousness by our religious works. And instead, we focus on encountering Jesus. Why is this our emphasis? It's it's this one primary reason that encountering Jesus changes everything. It's encountering Jesus that will change our lives. It's encountering Jesus that brings that life, that fulfillment, that joy, that sense of purpose, It's all found in relationship with him. See, religion is this effort to, you know, clean ourselves up from the outside in. And and the fact is that never works because none of us are ever going to be perfect enough. None of of us are ever going to have our thought life 100% dialed in and our attitude 100% dialed in and our behavior flawlessly, sinfully perfect, sinlessly perfect. It's just it's just never going to happen. And so religion is the efforts to clean ourselves up from the outside in. Grace, God's unearned favor and forgiveness, changes us from the inside out. See, transformation is an inside job. It's a work of the Holy Spirit that comes from a relationship with God, that comes from the inside out. So because of this, we embrace grace, not religion. We embrace grace grace and we reject religion the reason why we focus on grace is because grace actually delivers what religion promises religion promises hey you keep all the rules you check all the boxes and man god's going to love you and accept you and forgive you and you're going to experience all of god's blessings but the fact is it doesn't work that system is broken and does not work but it's faith in jesus that opens the door to all of those things Favor and forgiveness and and grace and God's blessing. It's all found in the grace of God through Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the answer to the questions that religion has been asking and the promises that religion has been making for centuries. This quest for acceptance, this quest for meaning and purpose and enlightenment, all of these things are found in Jesus. Now the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to believers who had started off in grace. They started off just trusting and encountering Jesus and and walking in His power to change them from the inside out. And they started shifting to focus on a religious system. And Paul writes to them in Galatians and, and, and corrects them. And he says, for when I tried to keep the law, talking about his own life and his own past, he says, the law condemned me. What he's saying was, no matter how perfect I tried to be, there's no way I could do it 100% of the time. So if I'm guilty of one point of the law, I'm guilty of the whole thing. So he says, what I did was, I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body, trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's saying, listen, I'm not going to focus on trying to change from the outside in. I'm going to let God transform me by the power of the Spirit through faith in Jesus from the inside out. He's saying, this is where change comes from. See, Jesus doesn't stand at the top of the stairway to heaven saying, 
Climb. Climb. All right, that's what religion says. Instead, what grace is, is that whisper from the cross when our Lord said, it is finished. The work is already done. I have provided a way for forgiveness and for acceptance. The battle is over. This is grace. This is what we celebrate. This is what we walk in as followers of Jesus Christ. And His finished truth that Jesus gives us, I think it's there on your outline, those of you who have your outlines, that Jesus gives us grace and truth. Jesus gives us grace and truth. Look at John 1.14. It says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of, what does it say? Grace and truth. So Jesus was the perfect embodiment of both of those things. Grace and truth. And when we encounter Jesus, when we encounter Jesus, we encounter both of those things. Grace and truth. Now, we tend to, as people, because of our personality types, we tend to kind of have a bias. Kind of we tend to lean a little bit more towards grace in our lives and our approach to life. Some tend to lean a little bit more towards truth in in our approach to life. You know, grace is that idea of, oh, you know, God loves us and he forgives and and, and, uh, he accepts us. And the focus on truth is, hey, this is right and this is wrong, right? So grace and truth, we tend to kind of, you know, have have different ways that we tend, what we tend to emphasize based on our personality type. You know, for example, there are dog people and there are deceived people, right? So, you know, we're all just kind of different in the way we we approach life. I'm just kidding. We have a cat at home. But anyway, um, the the fact is we, we tend to focus in different areas in terms of grace and truth. But Jesus was the perfect embodiment of both. 100% 100% grace, love, acceptance, and forgiveness, and 100% truth, that there's right and there's wrong. And he calls us to live righteously. So we, we look at, at grace, and you know, grace says you're forgiven. But truth says you're accountable also. Grace says you're accepted. But truth says you still have to change. Jesus is the perfect expression of grace and truth. So we want to encounter Jesus. John 1.14, the Word became flesh, and it says that He's full of grace and truth. We jump to verse 17. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through who? Jesus Christ. And, and this is the life-transforming power of knowing Jesus, that we have his love, grace, and forgiveness. But he says, listen, man, there's a a way I want you to live. There's a way that I've called you to live. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to empower you from the inside out to live that type of life. A great example of of Jesus being grace and truth, right? We talked about a couple of Sundays ago was the story of the woman caught in adultery. This woman was literally caught in the act of adultery, and the Jewish religious leaders took her, brought her to Jesus, trying to discredit Jesus, saying, what should we do with her? The Jewish law said that she should be killed, she should be stoned. But Jesus looked at the crowd and said, listen, those of you who are without any sin in your life or in your thought life, you cast the first stone. And one by one, the accusers dropped their stones and they walked. He asked her, hey, where are your accusers? Go, not here, same time, you to live a different way. See, this is grace and truth. So at Life Church, we reject religion as a way of earning God's acceptance, and we experience Jesus. We embrace grace. At Life Church, we show to everybody, all of us as church members, we show grace and truth to each other, and to anybody and everybody who comes through these doors to be a part of our worship. We show grace and truth all at the same time. I want everybody to understand, it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done or how you failed, there is grace available for you. Love and acceptance and forgiveness. You don't have to earn. You don't have to clean yourself up to receive it. All you have to do is, is go to Him in faith and ask Him. But then at the same time, God's truth remains. And He wants to empower us to live a different life 
a holy life. Not a perfect life, but a righteous life that's pursuing God and seeking to live a life that's pleasing to Him. This is, this is our focus. This is our emphasis as, as a church community. This is really this should be the priorities of every follower of Jesus Christ. And here's what's awesome about an environment of grace is that grace provides the type of environment where we can put down our masks and put down our religious acts and personas that we put out there, you know, where we're acting all perfect and acting like we've got everything together. Because in some churches, that's the, that's the expectation. We need to, everyone should be perfect to be a part of the club. And it's all kind of a competition as to, you know, how righteous we all are and who's more righteous than the other person. See, that's completely opposite of what grace is all about. And what's beautiful about grace is it removes shame. It removes guilt. I don't have to hide things. I don't have to worry about my secrets and my skeletons coming out because you know what? We're all imperfect. We all have our struggles. We all have those areas of sin that we struggle with either in our behavior or our attitudes or even our thought lives, whatever those things might be. And we're all invited to come and be recipients of God's grace and His power to change us from the inside out one step at a time. See, God can take our biggest mistakes and make something beautiful out of them. Only God, only grace can do that. I have a pastor friend who tells the story. He was at a pastor's conference with a bunch of other pastors. And on a Saturday, the conference ended on a Saturday morning. And he was at the airport and noticed that the other person next to him in the airport had the, the manual from the the conference that they were both at. And he says, hey, were you just at the whatever conference? Yeah, and he's a, they're getting to know each other. They're both pastors. Realize this guy's a pastor. And the guy told him, listen, I'm on my way home because we've got like a crisis situation going on. And he shared the fact that he pastors a very large church, very influential church in his, in his community. And um, his daughter had just gone off to college. It had just come home. And just told the family that she got pregnant. She was there as a pre-med major. She was a very high-profile person in the church as far as singing. And everyone in the community knew her. And just on one crazy night, had too much to drink when she was at college. And a night of fun uh, for her in that short-term moment, she, she, she got pregnant. And she came home and his daughter was just just coming unglued and she was just so sorry and she was apologizing to her family and I've embarrassed myself, I've embarrassed you, I've embarrassed the church and she was just crushed and this pastor was telling you know, my friend about all that he was, he was dealing with with her and what he did was that when that pastor walked in the room to his daughter I don't know if you can imagine yourself being in a similar situation uh, it's hard for you to maybe understand, you know, the expectations of people when you're, you know, but if you grew up in church, there were many churches where if you had a son or a daughter who got into trouble, other people in church would look down their nose at you, right? Like there's something wrong with you or those evil little kids. And, and you're right. You guys aren't keeping the rules. You're not fulfilling. And, and people can get alienated and ostracized. Right? Someone has a divorce and people treat them as though they have the scarlet letter on them. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you grew up in churches like that, that were all truth and no grace whatsoever. With this pastor, he later told my friend, and my friend has shared this story publicly. He went home to his daughter. and His daughter was in the living room sobbing and crying, expecting dad to come home. And she starts pleading and apologizing. Um, just how, how horrible she was feeling. And he walked over to her and he got down on his knees and he hugged her as she was sitting there on the sofa and said, baby, I love you. It's going to be okay. And if anyone in the church wants to reject you, they're going to have to reject me too. If they don't want you in the church, then they don't want me in the church either. We're going to get through this together. And you know what's awesome? Is that they did. And the church responded to her and to the family 
with tremendous grace. And it wasn't but a few years later that she got married. Uh, the, the daughter grew up and, and um, this pastor actually sent a picture of the baby. She was five years old. And this beautiful picture of this smiling little blue-eyed, blonde-haired little girl, five years old. And it was a, it was a little family picture of the, the daughter, the, 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 the pastor's daughter, their, their baby girl, and her new husband. And it was just like a portrait, portrait, a snapshot of what grace looks like. What God can do. That God can take our most embarrassing and broken moments and turn it around into something beautiful. See, the way that that outcome comes about in a, in a local church community is that we love, re- love each other like that. We love each other through those hard moments. We show the grace of God, but we stand on the truth of God at the very same time. How many of you would admit that we all need heaping doses of grace and truth in our lives, right? We all do, every one of us. And I want to challenge us that here at Life Church, those of you who are here, those of you who are watching online, that we always remain a community of believers where we understand where grace comes from doesn't come from our good works, doesn't come from doing it right all the time. It comes from Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. So we show that grace to one another. If you realize you need God's grace in some area of your life today, I want to encourage you to embrace his grace, embrace his truth. Know that he loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. He wants to help you change from the inside out. So I want us to pray together. Can we just bow our heads right now? Father, I just pray in this closing moment that, God, you would speak to all of our hearts. Those of us who are followers of Jesus, if we found that maybe we've slipped into a little bit of a religious mindset of focusing on outward acts of religious duty, of checking off boxes to earn your love and your acceptance, Lord, we just want to, afresh and anew, reject that as our system of righteousness. We reject religion. We, we realize that, Lord, you don't, you don't provide religion to us. You, you give us grace. Grace and truth. So, Lord, let us accept that in our own lives. Let your grace and your truth transform us on, from the inside out. Lord, let us confess our faults and our sins and our failings to you, trusting that you're going to empower change. We don't have to try to hide it from you because you already have accepted us. You've already decided to love us. So God, give us that liberty to just come clean and to be honest and admit what's going on on in our lives so that we can experience your power and your healing to change us. My friends, if you're here today and you realize that you're not living the way you ought to live, if you're not necessarily a Christ follower, if you're watching us online and and you just recognize that, man, you need to make things right between you and God, can I tell you, he offers you grace. He's not standing ready to condemn condemn you or beat you over the head. He's saying, listen, I'm going to accept you and love you and forgive you. I'm going to empower you to live a different life. So regardless of where you are today, just in your heart, just pray that prayer between you and God that just says, Lord, you know what I need today? And I ask you to help me. God, you know that if I've, I've treated people with a religious attitude and a mindset, look down on people, God, would you please forgive me for spiritual pride? Thank you, God, that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We all need your grace. So we love you today. We thank you for your acceptance. For those of us who are coming to you right now, Lord, we just want to say that here we are. We admit that we're a sinner. We need your forgiveness. So God, I just pray that you'd forgive our sins. Wash us clean by the blood of Jesus and what he did on the cross. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Change us from the inside out, we pray. We thank you for your love and for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.